I'd like to give you just, just a little bit of uh, thought about monogonase, and since I have it, why not? And, and especially, you know, many of us, uh, I, I assume, if there are new King James churches, I assume that there are going to be some that are associated with, uh, you know, communities that might uh, favor people coming to the Master Seminary. So, uh, again, it, this is not a case where if people do, ha does anybody have a new, Somebody look up New King James and just see if they still put only begotten. It is only begotten. Okay. Okay. And that reflects, you know, NASB is, uh, it's a fruit of evangelical scholarship of the 50s and the 60s. Uh, unless you have an updated one, but they didn't update very much. Uh, lexicography, you know, has, has moved forward. And I'll try to reflect this in, in my remarks here. Jesus is called monogenes in five New Testament passages. Modern translations tend to render the word only or one and only. In any case, emphasis falls on his singular status. He's uniquely related to the Father, so close to him as to be one with him. Yet, as distinct from him as was necessary to allow for full identification with humanity through the Incarnation. So you see the balancing act uh, that is underway there. Monogenes is used in Luke 7, and that should be italicized, but I think I lost something in the formatting when I switched from one computer to another. Monogenes is used in Luke to refer to the only child of the widow's son at Nain, to Jairus' daughter, and to an epileptic son, respectively. This shows that in conventional usage, the word connoted being the solitary child. A monogenes child was an only child. It wasn't anything to do about the only begotten, it was just the only child. The one other New Testament occurrence of the word is Hebrews 11:17, speaking of Abraham's near sacrifice of his one and only son Isaac. It has been suggested that for John, as for the writer of Hebrews, this incident serves as primary background for early Christian understanding of Jesus' sonship and sacrificial death. Understandably enough. I happened to read Genesis 22 today and my morning readings, and, you know, immediately when you read the language going on between Abraham and, and God telling him to go to them, or the angel of God telling him to go to the mountain and, and his son, I mean, it's got Christology written all over it and atonement written all over it. Genesis 22 of the Septuagint translates the Hebrew Yahid only as agapitas, beloved, rather than monogenes. Recent translations correctly reflect that Jesus' status as only begotten underscores his uniqueness rather than his place or mode of origin. It does not, for example, directly refer to his virgin birth, which is sometimes how it was understood in King James' days. Both as unrivaled expression of the Father's glory and as distinct from any created human, he holds preeminence, as Paul said. He is monogenes, utterly unique, in his person and saving role. The church father Jerome supplied the Vulgate's unigenitus, which does mean only begotten in Latin, to help counter the Arian view that Jesus was a created being. Unigenitus permitted Jesus to be begotten of the Father in the sense implied in certain Bible passages, while only uni left room for affirmation of his divine nature. Though the Vulgate's influence, or through the Vulgate's influence on early English versions of the Bible, the people who translated the King James probably knew Latin even better than they knew Greek, and they probably knew the Vulgate, the Latin version, at least as well as they knew the Greek version. Through the Vulgate's influence on early English versions of the Bible, the traditional translation only begotten still rings true for many today, which is why it's still in the New King James Version. But as far as what that means, all I'm saying is you're on, you're on uh, you know, firm ground if you say this is really pointing to the unique status of Jesus, um, you know, the, the, the ultimate form of his person and the ultimate uh, efficacy of his work. Monogenes. And I don't think you're going to find any lexica today that say only begotten.
All right, so I have uh, verses 14 to 18. So the numbers are 10, 3, 5, 10, 5, 10, 1, 2, 5, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2. Uh, preliminary translation, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Um, we'll skip over the cross references and commentary interaction. Uh, Stop points out that it is the Father who sent his Son into the world as Savior, who also sent his Spirit to our hearts as witness. Thus, he pointed out that Christian certainty rests on this combination of the objective and subjective, historical and experiential the Son's mission and the Spirit's testimony. As for the Father's sending of His Son, this, John writes, we have seen. The verb is the same as in, in verse 12. God in Himself no one has ever seen, but we have seen the Son whom He has, uh, whom he has sent. Uh, and then Lou uh, just points out that the title, um, Savior of the World, is uh, only used in one other place in the New Testament. That's where the Samaritans Say we know this is the Savior of the world in John 4, 39 and 42. Um, don't need to read the rest of that. Uh, final translation. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Um, grounded insight. Hang, hang on just a minute. Sure. Do I, do I read that right? That even though John writes this, that this is not a real honey way of understanding Jesus' role? Oh, actually, yeah, I did want, did want to comment on that. that um, yeah, that seems like, you know, that's Lou not really liking um, what would be typical Orthodox Christianity. Um, because, again, like you said, she wants to read First John as if nothing else has ever been written, and that this isn't necessarily the Apostle John or the Gospel of John. So. Okay. Okay, sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll take her word for it. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, granted insight. I'm going to try to move quickly because I know time crunch. Uh, he wants to get done with this course mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. I just I don't want to give other people a chance. Uh, we live in a day when people want to define Christianity as entirely subjective and experiential or entirely objective and historical. But as Stoff points out so well, there is certainly an objective reality to the gospel. The Father sent his Son into the world as Savior. This is historical fact. And on the other hand, Christianity is also experienced as indicated in the previous verse, 1 John 4.13, whereby the Apostle John explained that one component of assurance is the internal witness of the Spirit. So it's, it's both. There's, there's historical fact, you've got to believe, and also we, we have that internal witness in the Spirit. Uh, verse 15. The numbers are 3, 10, 5. Uh, that, that on should be an 11. Okay, sorry about that. On is, on is uh, the, the purest particle that we'll see all week. Okay. It, it by itself, it doesn't really mean anything, okay. but it, it, it is a signal that this is somehow subjunctive or conditional okay. or, or somehow theoretical. Yes? Uh, just a quick question about the previous verse. The uh, Savior of the world, appositional versus uh, uh, supplying a, a uh, an amy verb in there. Is, is there a significant difference between the two? Maybe just say God sent um, the Son, comma, the Savior of the world. Is it essentially communicating the same thing? Well, I think the two neatest translation solutions I think the two these translation solutions would be either to assume the Ani sent his son to be savior of the world or uh, clearly there, there's some kind of ellipsis here he's either ellipse uh, he's either leaving out Ani or he might be leaving out hosts as savior of the world I think those both are very legal. They 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 result in unobjectionable translations, and then you're not you're not adding in something more that he didn't feel like he needed to convey his idea. Okay, the 
numbers are three. Oh, oh okay. So I, I forgot, I put 10 there because I think the previous time A on, yeah. you do as conjunction, but on is definitely particle. Yes. Okay. So because three, here, here, a on me can mean if. And so it functions as a conjunction. But here, uh, on the, it's, it's not if. It tells you something about Haas. If on weren't there, it would say the one who confesses or he who confesses. But with the on, it's whoever confesses. It's subjunctive. Okay. So the on is a, here is a subjunctive marker. It is not. A, it is not a. Uh, in a sense, it's not a part of speech. You know, uh, although, and that's in a sense, a, a particle is. Uh, it's it's an untranslatable marker. Okay. Yes, Robert. Uh, the uh, I think the reason you put ten is is that the NA actually has on as uh, as a variant. Okay, so if you have a on there, uh, I, I would still, in that case, they, they may have it there because it's a more difficult reading, uh, but, but in that case, I would still, here I would call it an 11 because it's not translating if. If it's post-positive, then it's still functioning as a, as a particle. That, that it would probably be serving as a conjunction. It would be linking the protasis with the apotasis. Okay. Okay, thanks. So 3, 11, 5, 10, 2, 5, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 9, 3, 5, 10, 3, 9, 1, 2. Translation: uh, If one confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, then God abides in him and he in God. Uh, let's skip over the cross references. Um, we'll look at the the one that's the the mother love with the exclamation point. First John three twenty four. Uh, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. Uh, we know by this that he abides in us by the spirit he has given us. And it's just interesting here where it says that some of the abiding language, um, and in 1 John 3.24 it says, he, the one who keeps his commandments, in 1 John 4.15, uh, it's talking about confessing Jesus as the Son of God. But in a sense there, it equates, uh, at least on some level, keeping commandments and also confessing that Jesus is, is the Son of God again emphasizing that ethical, but also the doctrinal importance of doctrine. Um, commentary interaction. Uh, Stott says the aorist sense, homo legese, cannot be rendered precisely in English. John is referring neither to a future confession, shall confess, uh, nor to a present and continuing confession. Confesses, acknowledges, but uh, that might be Maybe you should say NIV, sorry. Uh, but to a single and decisive public confession, the time of which is unspecified. Uh, he also asks, uh, but how do people come thus to acknowledge the divine human person of Jesus? The apostolic testimony is necessary, but it does not compel assent. It is only by the Spirit of God that anybody ever confesses that Jesus is the Christ come in the flesh. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 2. Or, as he puts the same truth here, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, he thereby gives evidence of the fact that God lives in him and he in God. Again, the witness of the apostles must be something supplemented by the witness of the Spirit. Uh, Lou says, hence the confession here is not an intrusive aside, disrupting the flow of passage concerned with God and God's love, it is insufficient to predicate this interlocking divine and dwelling only on the communal embodying of love, uh, verse 12, or on the felt presence of God's spirit, verse 13. These may be deceptive and the spirit itself needs authenticating. The author never doubts the importance of what is believed. 
forgiveness is activated through the Son, the annihilation of the activities of the devil has been achieved by the Son of God. God's love has become tangible in God's sending of His Son. All this can be affirmed to be the case only because Jesus, named and identified, is God's Son. And uh, I actually thought Luke put that pretty well. And the the only thing, and she may she may uh, say this somehow here uh, she, where she says it is in the middle the author never doubts the importance of what is believed in other words she, she, she doesn't she really heightens the son the identity of the son the sending of the son I'd want to push that one step further faith in these things about the Son. And this, this is uh, John guarding himself about the anti-contextual use that you know, we were talking about a while ago, that you could pull the love part out. He very quickly goes back and talks about the faith part in his own discourse to make it clear that although he's just said love is the only thing, now he's going to say faith is the necessary thing. So, you know, at no time when we talk about one is John unaware that these others are just as essential. So, final translation. Uh, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Uh, granted insight, while John puts an emphasis on the need for believers to love one another and the importance of the internal witness of the Holy Spirit, he never taught that the possession of those two assurances, sorry, for all assurances, gave the individual a pass on right doctrine. That Jesus is the Son of God is an essential non-negotiable truth that must be believed. I'm going to quit uh, giving many lectures because they always turn up in the grounded insight. So. <laughs> well, I should just skip the grounded insight in that case. Sorry about that. No. Nope. Uh, it's, it's, good, it's good to hear it twice. 1 John 4.16 uh, The numbers are 10, 3, 5, 10, 5, 1, 2, 3, 5, one, two, nine, three, one, two, two, five, ten, one, six, nine, one, five, two. Ooh. Yeah, two. Uh, nine, one, two, five, ten, one, two, nine, three. Thanks. It's a prepositional phrase, so that's uh, pretty shameful. Uh, preliminary translation and we know and believe sorry we know and believe the love which God has for us God is love and the one who abides in him I'm sorry and the one who abides in love abides in God and God in him uh, we will uh, uh, skip over the cross references but I just want to highlight that again first John 3 24. Uh, is the mother load again because again the abiding language reciprocally between the believer and uh, God is highlighted here again commandments are stressed obedience to commandments are stressed in verse John 3 24 uh, but here it's, it's the fact that we know and believe the love which God has for us uh, grammar or his, uh, commentary interaction Stott says the historical mission of Jesus is evidence as much of the Father's love as of the Son's deity it tells us uh, not only that God loved, but that God is love. It is one thing, however, to know and believe the love God has for us and that God is love. It is another to live in love ourselves. Um, Lou, uh, actually, I think, had some helpful things to say here. I'm going to skip down to, well, uh, I'll read there. Contrary to those translations and the Nesli Alon 27, I'll put a paragraph break at this point, midway through verse 16. The repetition of the second part of the verse of the cardinal affirmation, God is love, in verse 8, is an integral part of the declaration of the first part. It is only because of what we have uh, of what we have known and are fully confident of that this statement about God's very nature can be made. At the same time, this is, uh, this is why to have known God's love is to know God and not just some incomplete aspect of God. I thought that was a really helpful point. Uh, because it's not just knowing God's love, but because God is love, it's still knowing Him um, fully. Final translation. 
and we have come to know and have believed the love which God has, has for us, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Uh, this verse differs, kind of inside, this verse differs from what is most often taught concerning faith in the New Testament. We are called to believe in God or to believe in Jesus, but here John says that we have believed the love which God has for us. However, this is not stating that we merely have a sentimental faith that reduces God to love, for God is love, and therefore to have known God's love is to know God, is not just some complete aspect of God. Again, according to Luke. There. Dr. Um, the end, uh, hey Min, is that is for a, is that a more rare uh, translation of end, or is that a typical? Talking about his translation? Uh, yeah, just uh, in the middle of the verse there, um, which God has for us, I mean, I guess it's not. Well, um, it probably has to do, and, and I don't know, did you have a reason why you chose the love which God has for us with N, hey Um, I'm trying to remember here. I, I think I was taking it as, I can't remember at this point. Yeah. What, what complicates things here is uh, echo and the fact that we're saying God has love and amen. What is, how would we say that in English? And you say God has love in us. I mean, is, is it saying that somehow, like what God, like electricity that, you know, he, that he stored it in us or he deposited it in us, is it making some... I mean, it wouldn't be a weird statement, but it would be a, a strange statement. God has love in us. <coughs> but then you want something more than eke. Eke wouldn't mean put. Um, the idea is... Um, God has, has, has laid claim to us. He has, he, he, he possesses, he has love for us. I mean, we say in English, he has love for us. So it, it has to do with, you know, the problem of, of that pressure. It's in, with, by default. If it has love with us, it's, I mean, I don't know of, of a better way. Um... Even if you say, has love among us, then it's like, you know, it's flying around somewhere. Uh, so I, did you look at other translations to see what they do? It seems like I mean, love in us is a, is a strange, uh, would be a strange English yeah. phrase. So yeah. I, I can see why, why we would say <coughs> it, because that's how we would express it. Um, but I don't know if there are some... Something else John's trying to communicate the word glossing over just to make it. Kind of I think and is I think I remember Murray Harris just published a new book on prepositions in the New Testament. In a way, it's, it's got to be it might be his magnum opus. He's written books on the divinity of Christ and, and he's wrote a great commentary on Colossians, verbal analysis, but or, uh, lexical analysis, verbal analysis. Um, yeah, I refer you to that book for treatments of end because it's the most comprehensive book and, and it does try to get at, you could say, theological uses of Jesuit prepositions. Okay. And I'm reminded of, um, I think it's at the end of Galatians where uh, Paul is just sort of summarizing his earlier life and the havoc that he wreaked on the church, on the church <coughs> And he uses the preposition N, and it's clip in Colossians 124. I'll 
start with 23. But only they were hearing that the one who persecuted us formerly now is preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying NMOI Tantaan. They were glorifying God in me. What? Uh, because of me, in, in my case. Uh, there's almost a four idea in the sense of as a result of this for this reason they were glorifying God. So it shows us kind of the, the rubbery nature of, of N and its margins of use. It can be put to uses that we wouldn't normally expect. Right. But which for a native Greek speaker like Paul, you know, you, you, you can push it. And here John may be pushing. And if he does, it's because he uses, he uses echo, echo. In, in a lot of different ways, and just like the English word have, it can go, drives non-native speakers nuts. If you look it up, it's got like 80 different definitions. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of that way in Greek. Okay. That's, I would explain it by the rubberiness of echo. Okay. Thank you. All right, so 417, uh, the numbers are nine, three, five, one, two, nine, three, <coughs> ten, two, five, nine, one, two, one, two, ten, eight, three, five, ten, three, five, nine, one, two, three. Uh, preliminary translation. In this, love has been perfected with us so that we would have uh, blank, I couldn't remember, confidence. I uh, wasn't confident of that. In the day of, uh, and I didn't get that one either, it was judgment, uh, that just as he is, even we are in the world. Um, Cross-references, there's a couple uh, of those mother loads. So um, I'll read those real quickly. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. It's that idea of uh, perfected and it has here is, is relating it to keeping of God's word. Uh, 1 John 3, 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Again, speaking of the confidence here that uh, we would have confidence in the day of judgment uh, is what 321 would be in reference to. Uh, commentary, interaction. Uh, Scott says the, the Apostle John is concerned with the completion not of God's love in us, but of our love for God. John is not suggesting that any Christian's love could in this life be flawlessly perfect, but rather developed and mature, set fixedly on God, upon God. He describes two marks of such perfect love, namely confidence before God and love of our brothers and sisters. Uh, Lou adds this, by this point in the argument, the love that God offers is inseparable from the love experienced and shared in the community of love. This communal dimension is emphasized by the replacement of in us by among us with the preposition meta, which may also remind the readers that they are not passive partners in this and perhaps recall the purpose of the letter, <coughs> fellowship with or among meta us. Although, although meta, well, I mean, I'm happy, obviously, we're taking this, this uh, among. It's an extension of, of, of with. When you learn meta, in first year you learn with, and properly so. It's a synonym with, of, of uh, soon. So, um, this is really Emmanuel, God with us. This is the idea. And for that reason, I, I'd, I'd want to push back a little here. God, the love God offers is never inseparable from the love we experience. The, God, the love God offers is always separable from, because we are not God. It's always God, someone else, with us. 
creatures. We do not want to blur the distinction between God and his gifts and ourselves and our community. And you know, however exalted we may feel in the presence of God, he still remains God. You know, we're not divinized, and he doesn't disappear into our experience. So, just uh, I'm telling you, when you're living in a world where the transcendence of God has been denied, people are very, very quick to sort of breathe a sigh of relief and, and sort of say, okay, we kind of know what God's about now. He's about us. Yeah, he's about that exalted sense of his presence. And that's one reason why in some settings they work so hard every Sunday to conjure up that <coughs> feeling. Because at the end of the day, that's what God's about. He's about the feeling we share. But then that really hamstrings God to be what he also is. You know, he is the stern father who whips every child he receives. Those whom the Lord loves, he scourges, he disciplines, paideia. You know, and we want, to, we want to leave God the flexibility to remain outside of, of our experience so that you know, he can come to our sphere through the different doorways that he needs to. We, we, we like that affirming and exciting doorway. God, the great assurer, and placator of our anxieties. The God, the, the therapeutic God, the, the life of the party God. That's the door we want to open all the time. But how about God the discipliner? Now, how about, as my friend with the cancer victim, how about God the not present when we wish he were here. Why are you cast down within me, O oh my soul? How long, O oh Lord? You know, there are those times in our life and those seasons when he's not there. And you're a big hypocrite if you act like you're full of joy of the Lord. Because you know you don't feel it. And you'd be weird if you did. I mean, a lot of you are old enough now, you've, you've been hit by things like grief. You know, somebody dies, and it just it shocks you. And you're outside of yourself. I mean, something has come into your existence. And it's like, you know, I've got tinnitus, and I'm always hearing this all the time. And that's how I, that's how I uh, to myself, that's, that's how I feel about grief in extreme cases. It just overwhelms you. You might not have an appetite. You might not have any urge at all to sleep for 24, 30, 40 hours. And it's not like because you're worked up. It's just something has invaded your presence that you just kind of got to wait it out. So something changes. And that's the way God is sometimes in his absence. Uh, you know, my wife had three miscarriages. What do you tell your wife? There's nothing to say. You could hug her. You, know, you might weep with her. Nothing you can say. It's just, it's imponderable. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And I suppose if you're, you know, if, if you're, wise and mature, you can say, blessed be the name of the Lord. But, you know, you're, you're, you may not feel that very deeply right after the DNC, and you go back to the recovery room. And especially if this were a big deal in your life. You know, sometimes miscarriages are cataclysmic because maybe they represent 10 years of infertility therapy and tens of thousands of dollars and you know, church prayer chains, and, and then, you know, people rejoice, and oh, thank you, God, for answering prayers, and then, you know, it might be the light of your life, it might be the hope of your marriage, and then it gets taken away. So where's God then? 
you got to leave we got to leave room for God to be something outside of our experience because there's going to be times when he's not going to be in our experience in any positive way I mean, by this is where faith is so important we know by faith he hasn't abandoned us and sometimes that is just a bare rational proposition in our minds which by experience we've learned I'm not going to adopt rational propositions about God that I know are true. He is with his people. I can trust God's promise. But don't ask me to smile right now. <laughs> Talk to me in a month. Um, final translation. Uh, by this love has been perfected among us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because just as he is, so also are we in this world. Grounded in sight. For the unbeliever, the day of judgment will be a dreadful event, full of fear, remorse, and regret. For the believer, however, the day of judgment can be faced with confidence because love has been perfected among them. Should be called the believers then. Um, this love must be for God and for fellow believers, otherwise it is not perfected in mature love. So is the so the meta is okay to translate as among us? I, I kind of want to do on that. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's not the sin unto death. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> um, first John four eighteen, the numbers are two, eight, five, nine, one, two, ten, one, two, two, eight, five, one. Two, ten, one, two, two, five, one, ten, six, eight, five, nine, one, two. And, and, and by the way, uh, can we? Yeah. On on that question, with or among or, or whatever else, this is where number one, you're preaching a translation or you're teaching a translation in a church. So that you know, the first question: What what is your translation? What are people going to have there? And then if you're going to propose a difference. A different translation than they have, and you know you're, you're reading Luke. Well, that's an interesting idea. Then I, I would look and see if another published translation goes with a monk. <coughs> so is that, is that, they may, you know, in the boredom of this class, they may kind of kind of check to see if any other translations do a monk. I think I'll look briefly. I, just, I don't remember seeing one. Yeah, and if I didn't find one, then you would not. Then while I might bring in the idea that, that, that among is true, Lou might, you know, I might take that take it that far to talk about the, the, the community presence of God. Uh, I would stick with the lexical meaning, which is most simple, which is with. And especially in a tradition where we have Immanuel, Imanu, you know, with us. Uh, it, it almost, it, you know, that almost begs to be related to the, the broader concept of God with His people. But, but the with idea threatens to dissolve God into the people, and um, that's the downside of, of the among idea. Uh, and it's not, it's, it's, there's not such a problem with end because the end preposition. It implies there, there's a there's a there and then there's a here. You know, God is among us because He's in. He's, he's entered into. But the the among taking out the idea of with lends itself more to this dissolution idea. Yes. The uh, New Revised Standard does among, and then my brother was saying the NIV also. The New King James. Yes. The New King James says among? Yeah. yeah. Whoa. Okay. Well, then you've got, you know, you got lots of precedents for among. <laughs> Did any of them say with? Um, English Standard, yeah. NAS. NAS. Okay, so, you know, we've got divided house on the translators. I'm just going to ask a question with regards to Exodia. Is that a. Um, there was an adverb. Could it also be a proper preposition? Let's see. Uh, it, it can't be because it doesn't have an object. Wait, wait a minute. 
perverse. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It doesn't have an object, so it is an adverb. Yes. Uh, isn't Pelea an adjective for this one right there? Yes. Yes. It's it's what kind of law? Perfect law. Go to your. Do you have a cross reference that's important? Uh, no, not not this one. Uh, I did have a question about actually about exo and, and follow. Uh, I know that ek follow is a pretty common verb as well. Is there a is there a difference in meaning or a nuance there between using the adverb versus just using ek follow? It's probably more intensive with the, with the adverb. Just okay. because it's 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 rather rather unusual. Yeah. Uh, Scott says the the same truth is now stated negatively. The love that spells confidence vanishes fear. There is no fear, i.e., no servile fear in love. That is, there's no room for fear in love. And it would be and it's that way. The two are as incompatible as oil and water. We can love and reverence God simultaneously, uh, Hebrews 5, 7, but we cannot approach him in love and hide from him in fear at the same time. Uh, Romans 8, 14 and 15, 2 Timothy 1, 17. Indeed, it is by love for God that a false, cringing fear of God is overcome. And Luke kind of chimes in as well. Uh, the opposite of bold confidence would be fear, but fear can only be present if the outcome is uncertain and the attitude of the judge is unpredictable. For fear is prompted by the expectation of being punished, whether deservedly or not. Final well, chance. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, I'll, I'll wait until you've got an insight to okay. see what you do with this. Uh, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears has not been perfected in love. Grounded insight. While there is still a need for even believers to fear God, we are not to fear God in the sense of dreadful terror or punishment. This is the type of fear that John describes here. Therefore, if you love God, you will not fear punishment. But if you do not love God, you ought to fear punishment. So kind of the thing I was going with is, I know there's other scriptures that talk about the fear of God, but here it says fear has to be with punishment. <coughs> Contextually, how is understanding John speaking of fears is kind of in line with what Lou was saying in terms of not being sure what the outcome is or, or expecting punishment or uh, something along those lines. Um, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think your, your insight is good, and I think your translation works. Notice, here again, we see the problem of echo. Uh, that's just, you know, fear. Because fear has punishment. <laughs> what, what does that mean? And you, I mean, your rendering works. Okay. Um, but the only point I would want to make is fearlessness doesn't necessarily mean perfection in the love of God. There, there are a lot of people who don't fear God, and it's not because they're perfected in God's love. And here, here's, here's the formula, I think, that, that you have to ponder. When is no fear of God, which which could be you know like confidence and like Scott writes about you know a, a complete open we don't fear God we don't it's not no servile fear no cringing okay when is that presumptuous because we run into presumptuous people. You know, we, we run into no fear type people and you know they're sleeping around and they're in our church you know they're they're uh, they're gossips on the church chain uh, they're, they're they're doing porn and they're you know they don't have any fear they're, they're very confident in their walk before the Lord is that what John's talking about 
So I like it in your explanation, it related to punishment. You know, it's like eschatological wrath. Certainly we can say, you know, we should fear eschatological wrath insofar as we have the assurance of God's blessing through faith in Christ. So we got we got a zone where we can know we're sinners and we don't have to fear hell every night. But just like taking love out of context and, and reducing it all to love and promoting a sentimentalism, this can in an age where everybody wants to get rid of hell, this also can be taken too far. Yes? If uh, fear would be defined similar to like the concept of punishment or condemnation with you know, hell, um, in your commentary on page 259, after quoting uh, Schneckenberg, say that he asserts the author knows that his readers have not yet attained a perfect love. And then you write, has anyone in this life? No, except for Christ. Does that mean that no one is um, excluded from the realm of fear? Well, I want to read what I wrote in context, too. <laughs> well, 18 does serve to banish fear from the the Christian repertoire of uh, feelings or convictions that that should be haunting us. So I, I think he wants to uh, heighten the the confidence that we have in the day with respect to the day of judgment. Remember, this is this is back close enough to the apostolic age that. And John, I think, is a Jewish writer. You know, Jewish eschatology taught that there's this age, and then there's the day of the Lord. There is the eschatological judgment. And John the Baptist was taken to be an eschatological harbinger. And Jesus was endorsed by the guy, in, in saying uh, the kingdom of God is at hand, it was as good as saying the day of judgment is right at the doorstep. So the day of judgment, I think, was much less theoretical than it is typically in, in our church circles. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and I think <coughs> John here is uh, allaying misplaced fears the fear that no matter how right you get with God, you're never, you're never going to get free from the eschatological terror. And if you want an example of this, you know, um, I mean, good Catholics, really good Catholics, should always be motivated by eschatological terror. And we may have a few Catholics here, and. And you can endorse me or not on this, but the Catholic Catechism, you know, the big thick book that you can buy and read up on the teachings of the church. Uh, my wife, you know, she was a Catholic when we got married. Uh, to believe that you know you're going to heaven is a mortal sin in Catholic theology. To this day, it's a mortal sin. That's a, that's a, that's. That's a Latin-based way of saying a sin unto death. That in itself is a sin that will, that will assure you of eschatological wrath <laughs> if you claim that you know you will be in heaven. Any Catholics here that can? It's in the catechism. I'm, I'm not Catholic. My family was, but I was a missionary in Italy for seven years. So we ran into that all the time. Yeah. You get out of mass and go, you know anything could happen in the next five minutes. You could get hit by a bus and go right to hell. You could probably sin in those five minutes. Yeah, that's why purgatory is such a treasured teaching because it it gives you a 
a zone of hope. But, but I mean, I remember going to my mother-in-law's funeral. She was a very devout Catholic. And just the homily the priest gave made it clear how important it was that all of us are diligent in our prayers for her soul and in our own adherence to and faithfulness to the church <coughs> because her being in purgatory where she was going to end up had to do with how we come in and help her now and same for us so it's this, so it's this great chain of uncertainty about where our souls are going to end up and we can have a certain hope but it really is you know what is is just Certain is also sort of uncertain. Also Muslims. Now we have the doctrine of jihad, which is controversial in Islam. The doctrine of jihad says that the jihad warrior who dies in the cause will immediately be in paradise. Um, even some Muslims have, you know, argued that that's, you know, overdoing uh, what the Quran teaches. But but that's an exception. Imams, normal Muslims, no matter how devout, one reason you better stay devout, God is inscrutable. And nobody knows, no Muslim knows when they die, what God is going to do with their soul. That's why you need to be as submitted as you can possibly be. To have the best hope, the best angle you can get on this, because there's no assurance of salvation in Islam. There is assurance. There is assurance of salvation in Christianity. And, and we're, we're, we're right at the sweet spot of it. Relative to God's eschatological wrath, which John the Baptist came warning about, which the end of Malachi warns of. And that's, what, that's one reason the Jews thought when John appeared, it was an eschatological sign. And, and the resurrection of Jesus is uh, it, it, it verifies the eschatological nature of the, of the meaning of the coming of Christ. Because when the dead start rising, we're right at the doorstep of the age to come. So, so because of the nearness of, of the coming age, which is going to close the door on, on all hope of salvation, it would be easy to be fearful. And uh, Greco-Roman religions typically had a sense of, of you know, a, a terrible thing happening when you die. You might be savaged by the underworld. They didn't know what to do about death. So there's a lot of uncertainty. So John is here giving us a very strong platform beyond which we should not worry about descending. There's a, there's a level at which Christians should fear God. There's all kinds of ways in which it's, it's healthy to have a very strong respect for God and I, I don't I don't like being taken to the woodshed by God to go back to Hebrews 12 I don't like God's divine discipline whether it's he just wants to make me better than I already am or whether I've done something foolhardy and now I'm going to pay the consequences for it. I don't like that and I'm afraid of that happening but there is a, a, a legitimate necessary respect for God and fear of screwing up that I think is just, it's just good sense. In the same sense that I don't want to do foolhardy things that get my wife angry with me. It's a, you know, I've learned from experience, don't go there. So, and, and phobos, I think, is a word that describes that zone between me and my wife. I don't want, I, don't, I fear my wife. But it's in a larger context, it's, it's commitment, it's mutual acceptance. Now, I'm not worried about her eschatological wrath. <laughs> so, I think there's an analogy, and here he's talking about the eschatological wrath dimension. Okay, and we have assurance that we're not going to face that. So based on what you wrote and what you're saying now, can I take the perfect... Are you a lawyer? No. <laughs> the perfect love... Um, and the perfected in love, can I um, relate that then to Christ? Can I say that that perfect love is Christ, not my perfect love, but Christ's perfect love that then casts off my fear? Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure that. And that would go along with all of these paraphrastic constructions where the love of God has been perfected yeah. in us and among us. Okay. From God's side, from Christ's side, that is a finished work in his 
totally done its job. I don't need to fear that somehow, because I fail to measure up in faith, ethics, or love, that the trap door might open and finally I, I suddenly find myself in the flames. That totally makes sense. So and that's a lot, there's a lot, that's a lot of assurance. It is. It's but it also is enough assurance that I can doubt myself. I, 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 can, I can confess my sins. I don't have to come to God and try to show I'm perfected. Right. You know, that, that I have an assurance based on my conformity with all these conditions. And that's where my assurance is. Because then I'm back, right back in the same trap of not trusting him anymore, trusting in myself. So there's no fear when we abide in that law. Yeah. So Romans 8, 1, no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Um, relating that to the eschatological uh, clearance of uh, um, of the wrath that we'll receive from God, same with 1 Thessalonians 5. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there can be a displeasure of God in our lives um, now. Um, but that, but you'd say that wouldn't fit under His wrath per se, but more uh, an expression of His love. Sure. Well, again, if I could use Hebrews 12. Yeah. The the discipline of, of God. Okay. okay. Yes, you can. Uh, I want to ask you about a couple passages in Matthew because I've been thinking about this a little bit. And, and, you know, Matthew, and someone Mount Jesus says, um, you know, it, it, it's better to pluck out your eye and throw it from you than to suffer in, in hell, essentially. Same thing, you know, cut off your right hand, throw it at your heaven with, with one hand than to go to hell with both hands. And there seems to be a, a use of fear as a motivation or even... You know, he says, don't fear man who can destroy body, but fear him who can destroy body and soul and hell. So I'm trying to wrestle with how those fit in here. Is that something different? Because he's not necessarily speaking to believers. How do we make sense of that? And if so, then do we not use those verses in combating sin and <coughs> man no. as believers? Well, you know, I'm a great believer in, in the highest and noblest motivations. So I, I think that's that's our, our default. But Sometimes we're not responsive to highest and noblest motivations. And it's better to do the right thing for the second or third best reason. Maybe the third best reason for not doing this is fear of the consequences. Okay? So don't do it. Don't rationalize it by saying, you know, I know I shouldn't do this because God loves me and God loves it, but you know, I don't really feel that love that strongly. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it because I don't feel that bad about doing it. You know, it's absurd reasoning, but I'm, I know sometimes people do bad things because they're not motivated not to do them. So, um, yeah, I think I think Fear is not the noblest motivator, but to go, if, 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 if it takes fear to keep you from sinning, then fear the Lord. There is, in other words, put it another way, there is within covenantal assurance, within the big picture assurance of God's faithfulness to his purpose and faithfulness to his people, that there is a necessary trepidation. Can I use that word? There's a trepidation. Like Paul saying, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Woe be to me if I do not preach the gospel. You know, you could you could imagine yourself sometimes not stepping up when you need to, or not stepping up like to, like you should, and you just don't want to go there. You know, when when you think about that, you're filled with. Uh, what was uh, Kierkegaard's word? Uh, angst. Uh, you're filled with anxiety. You're filled with uh, trepidation. So it's a form of fear. But the, the context of it. I also think of Jeremiah. And I think of a lot of the, the laments uh, that we find in the Old Testament and in, in the Psalms and so forth. 
you know, there, there's a there's a broad range of uh, licit experience in the Bible that you know comes about from meditating on the excellence of God, or the holiness of God, the perfection of God, and then the despair when we it hits us what we've just done. You know, some of the penitent, uh, penitential psalms. You know, there, there's a, a, a great despair there. And I don't think that the psalmist was in and out of covenantal redemption. I think he is within that zone, but I think he's being honest with his feelings and also being being honest with the, the monstrosities. You know, Bathsheba was no small thing. Uriah was no small thing. And as some of the penitential psalms reflect David's remorse about those things, he, he, he retains a very strong view of the nature of God. If he doesn't just keep yucking it up because, well, I'm a child of the covenant. Now, you can't say, well, that was Old Testament and, and this is new, but I, I just don't, I don't see that. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't see us as you know, being encouraged to have a sort of a yuck it up view of God. Uh, and, and they were they had fears that we shouldn't have anymore. I, I've been called that presumptuous. And I, I don't see New Testament writers. Like here, I don't see him saying, don't be like David, who felt like there was something to fear for sin. We don't need to fear when we sin anymore. We sin. We have an advocate, but that besides because we have an advocate, we better not presume, we better confess, we better get get things right, we better let God deal with us. So, you know, your assurance is tied in with your doctrine of God. And uh, God is free to call us on the carpet. And as my father used to say, turn us every way but loose. <laughs> Robert, I'm going to turn you every way but loose, he used to say. And I had great fear. And it was well-placed fear. And I did not want to fall into the hands of God. But you know, when David screwed up in the census, he had three choices. And two of them involved human wrath and punishment. And he said, God's merciful. I'm going to cast myself under God's punishment because he'll stop at some point. <laughs> and he's the God who's a, who abounds in Tessin. So by the nature of God's law, the nature of God, the faithfulness of his promises, and the finished work of Christ, there's a floor to our fear. <coughs> our fear is redefined. It, it doesn't justify the cavalier attitude toward God or toward sin that is presumptuous. And that's that's a that's a tough distinction. You know, we see it in our children. This is where you know I've been talking about wives all week. You can also talk about child rearing, where you're trying to teach your children in the Lord unconditional love, but kids will try to take advantage of that. Uh, Ken, you and I were sort of talking, and I did it myself as a kid. I can still remember. When I learned, the first time I, I was told basically, you know, if you do something wrong and you come and tell us, they might have even made a mistake and say, you won't get punished. Ooh. You know, new possibilities open up. So you go ahead and do the thing you know you're not supposed to do, but then you, before the consequence, then you go and you act, oh, I'm sorry I did that. You know, that worked maybe one time. <laughs> and then my parents realized, you know, we're being taken for dupes here. So then suddenly they went back on their promise. <laughs> but you know, that was never the intent of their promise, to justify me in a duplicitous approach to them. But you see, this is what happens in churches, is people hear unconditional love. And there's no fear in love, and, and blah, 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 blah. And they get the idea, I mean, in a lot of Protestant circles, it, it's the worst of the, the stereotype of the Catholics, is that you sin, 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 and then you go to church. And 1 John 1, 9 is like a Christian gargling session. 
It's for sin man. It's a sin management technique. Grace doesn't eradicate sin. It doesn't. It doesn't cleanse us and lift us to a higher level and teach us to delight in defeating the flesh by the power of the Spirit. It teaches us to sin with impunity, but then go to God and, and confess it and be cleansed. If we confess, He forgets. And it's, you know, it's, like, it's like some sick addiction. It's the dog returning to its vomit in the name of Christ. And if we're doing that, you know something, we better, we better, we better bring Phobos back in here. Because if that's our syndrome, do we really know God? I mean, that's what Paul says to the Corinthians. I write this to your shame. There's some of you here who don't know God. 1 Corinthians 15. 2 Corinthians, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. You know, things could be so bad, the indicators might be, we got to go back to square one here with some of you folks. And I don't doubt we have unregenerate people in the church. So it's an excellent question. You know, what did I mean by fear of God? And, you know, I want to say in covenantal, the covenantal walk with God, we have a, a wide range of licit emotions, so that you know we we can give vent to the full extent of our perceptions, both joyous and grievous. I, I hope you know. Every day, we're not grieving over you know profoundly wrong-headed behaviors and attitudes. We do we do all stumble in many ways. We fall short of God's glory, so we have sins to confess probably most hours of the day. But those times do come, and especially in the lives of newer Christians. Remember when he wrote to the Thessalonians, and you know he's like almost fawning your love and your faithfulness and oh you're so commendable and what you're doing it's, it's going on everywhere the news of you know, you received the word of that we preach not as the word of men but what the word of god which does its work and you know and it's like man these people are at the top of the, the top of their game you know chapter one two three then he gets to chapter four now i want you to excel still more uh because this is god's will your sanctification that you abstain from fornication what? Abstain from fornication? <laughs> you know, it, it, and it's obvious. And, and if you study, if you study the greco roman world, you see that <laughs> sleeping around in sexual immorality, nothing unusual about that. In fact, I haven't said this this week, but most classes I teach, I, 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 you know, I, I make a point of this because in the, in, a lot of us are conditioned by Christianity, put it mildly, and we have an automatic, an automatic tendency to relate God, the God that sent His Son. We relate God to morality. That's just you know we don't even think about that. But in the Greco-Roman world, as in much of the world today, there's no connection between religion and right and wrong. See, the Greeks didn't have gods and goddesses with commandments. These were gods of circumstances and experiences and domains. And actually, to get in touch with the gods, you might actually engage in activities that the God of Moses said was sin. The, the God of Moses is the God who, who's holy, and, and in our terms, he defines that in part by you should not commit adultery. You know, and then Jesus gives a little gloss on that to say, well, that's that's even like the lustful look. But that was totally foreign in the in the ancient world. And people like the Thessalonians would hear the gospel would come to Christ, and a month or two later, you know, just looking at the men as, as, as the run of guys in the church, they're still visiting prostitutes. You know, and, and it would have been news to them that God would have something to do necessarily and, and, and rigorously with your sexual purity. 
Now Paul makes that point very, very, you know, very quickly in their new Christian instruction that you got to quit defrauding your brother and you got to get a grip on your skewos, which is probably what it sounds like it is. Skewos is a euphemism for the male sex organ. It's in First Thessalonians four. I don't know, 4, 4, or 4, 8, it's right in there somewhere. And it gets translated sometimes as vessel or something like that, which sometimes almost makes it sound like it's the one. It's not the woman, it's you. And uh, your sexual faculties now are under the lordship of Christ, and, and you know they're, they're purified and perfected for that reason. So what I'm saying is in our culture now, we're going to get people, and we get people in our counseling, you know, in our, you know, we, we evangelize, and they come into the faith, and you start finding out they're, I mean, I don't know, they're dealing drugs, or they're pimps, or, you know, there's all kinds of things that people might continue to do because it's just a part of their life. Maybe from way back. Like that guy, you know, who said he'd been doing porn since he was 11 years old. And they come to faith in Christ, but then they start realizing the implications. You know, the, the house cleaning that God's going to start doing. And, uh, you know, best case scenario, they, they, they start giving way to God's house cleaning. And they start growing in their conviction of the goodness of God. And uh, because they see the progress that God is making, and, and they start to you know, be nurtured by a sense of, of God's goodness and, and his ownership of their lives and affairs, the capacity and the need for fearing God, eschatologically, it, it withers. <clears throat> because they're being upheld and moved out of that zone of potential fear because of their behavior by the work of God in their lives. So fear is bad. But what about people who, for whatever reason, are making pretenses of confession of faith in God, but they've got a double life, they've got a secret life, and they're not turning loose on it? There's a lot of that. There's a lot of double deal. I mean, that's why the sin that Jesus condemned most frequently and most universally was hypocrisy, which is basically two faiths, two identities. The Pharisees had a public, open, religious face, but he said, Inside, your hearts are like graves, rotting bodies. You're rotten inside. And, and we have this problem of people that have learned to live exteriorly a certain way. And they beat their wives at home. Or, as in the case of women that I've counseled in the years that, that I've been teaching, women who have, you know, who, who said, my uncle raped me. He's still my uncle. He's still at the family reunions. He's still in leadership in his church. And now I'm 25 years old. And I can't, I can't get it out of my mind, and I don't know what to do. I mean, do I want to blow my family apart? And you know, this woman struggled very, very seriously with. I mean, it's a miracle she was still at a Christian college because she couldn't help, it, especially at that age, saying, "What's this church stuff? What's all this Jesus stuff?" You know, and at her age, sort of like. Somewhere very close. I mean, I think she was still a child emotionally. I don't think she had a category to even know what was happening to her. There, I mean, I hope you don't have that guy in your congregation. But if you have a very big congregation, you're going to have that guy in your congregation. You're, you're going to, and maybe he doesn't come to church. Maybe. But I, I'm just saying. It's an excellent question, you know, what's the place of the fear of God? We don't want to banish it from consideration. 
because there's so much that goes on that is still subject to God's eschatological wrath, and, and it's still part of the experience of people in the church. So we want to be, you know, we want to be presenting the whole counsel of God. And this is not a, a, a license to kick the wrath of God out of the rhetoric of the church. Certainly, we who know Christ in faith don't have to fear eschatological wrath. But in ministry, and I, I refer you to the end of Jude, have mercy on some with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. I'll close with you know this note, which is, I mean, it doesn't need to be publicized everywhere, but it's not a secret uh, that some years ago. Uh, where I was ministering in seminary, uh, I won't even say where it is, it doesn't matter, but uh, one well-known pastor in the area who planted a, you know, a church that's it's still going church today, very well respected because of his diligence and of his, um, his commitment and his effectiveness, his skill, his love, his knowledge of the scriptures. Uh, and actually, Rich, you know, uh, he, he was single. So like you said, he had time that maybe other people didn't. And uh, the one thing that looking back people said showed that uh, a, a little danger sign was that nobody really knew him because he was always doing things for other people. You know, but, but nobody really could say, I really felt, you know, he like opened up to me. And uh, to make a long story short, he committed suicide. His men went to his house at 6 o'clock on a Monday morning because they had a men's Bible study on Monday morning. One of them was a student in my Greek class. And uh, he was the first one there, actually. And it was a part of the city where they had, you know, bars on the windows and stuff and doors and they, they could see his feet in there on the couch and you know they're knocking on the door and they're going ah he fell asleep and and uh, you know it's gonna be funny when he does wake up and, but he you know he wouldn't wake up and he is he had asphyxiated himself and uh, of course the presbytery had an investigation and blah 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 and, and it turned out that in that part of the city, this was some years ago, and, and HIV uh, AIDS ministry was just really getting going at that point, and the church really wanted an outreach because they were living in that part of that city where there was a, a large gay population. So they were really doing outreach, and he compromised himself in that outreach. So he was having mercy, and it was an effective ministry, but somehow he lost his fear. This is where I think the fear of God. We need to fear God more than we might either fear the consequences of not doing what we want to do. Oh, well, if I don't do this, I'll be lonely. I won't. I won't have this pleasure. You know, we need a fear of God at times. I think to to be the ultimate motivator against the behavior that's going to betray our own best. And I, you know, I do expect to see that man in heaven. Uh, just like it wasn't three years later, another man in that same city, the pastor of the church that my wife and I attend, like he committed suicide. It was a public enough matter that uh, the elders of the church decided that they would print his suicide letter in the St. Louis Post Dispatch because it was more or less a public letter to his elders and to his congregation. A letter of apology and, and a letter of uh, various things in the letter. Um, the, these are pretty morbid things and these are, these are pretty troubling things. And it's the reality of the world we live in. You know, the, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But greater is he that is in the world than you. It's not you're greater than the one, so it's the one who's in you 
or among you is greater than the one who's in the world. So uh, we don't want to turn loose of our consolation and our, 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 our uh, life jacket against fear is Christ. And there is an assurance from fear in Christ.